Hello again. This is Chapter 2, Video 1, in which we'll be introducing our first symbolic language, the language S. This will be our language for truth functional logic, the language in which we take simple statements as our basic non-logical component. First then, a little bit about what we mean by simple versus a compound statement. The basic idea is that a simple statement is one which does not contain further statements as parts, whereas a compound statement does contain further statements as a part or parts. This is best illustrated with some examples. Our first three statements here, Manet changed painting, Manet subverted traditional artistic norms, and Manet cleared the way for Monet, we will each count as simple statements. And on the basis of a little bit of our knowledge of art history, we'll take each of these statements to be true. They don't have to be true to be simple statements, but that's just how we're working the example here. Consider number four, Manet did not change painting. We haven't taken two simple statements and put them together here. We've taken one simple statement, number one, and negated it with the not in the center there. We count this as a compound statement because the not operator allows us to make a more complex statement out of a simpler statement. Now, obviously, given that we've taken number one to be true, the truth value of number four is false. The negation of a truth is a falsehood. Here's another example. Number five, Manet changed painting and he subverted traditional artistic norms. Here we've taken uh, sentence one and sentence two and put them together with the conjunction and. Now given that the two sub-sentences, one and two, we are both taking to be true and we're using an and here, then the whole of five is also true. Here we take number one, negate it again, and number three, and negate it, and then put that together between an if-then construction, and we get the more complex, if Manet did not change painting, then Manet did not clear the way for Monet. As you can see, we can iterate this compounding process as much as we like to make more and more complex compound statements. Now, it might not be clear at this point, but we can also determine the truth value of 6 on the basis of the truth values of 1 and 3. It turns out that since 1 is true, the part between the if and the then is false, and the part following the then is also false since 3 is true. So a false in, it, false in an if-then will soon learn result in a true conditional. So for 4, 5, and 6 here, we're able to determine the truth value of the complex whole just on the basis of the truth values of the components. Not all compounding functions are like that, however. Take number seven here. We take sentence one, Manet changed painting, and attached to that, Monet believed that. So we get a new statement, slightly more complex, saying that Monet believed that Manet changed painting. Now, of course, we're taking this portion, the number one portion of the sentence, to be true, but just on the basis of that, we can't determine whether the whole is true or not. We would need to do some historical or biographical research. So for seven, we can't determine the truth value of the whole simply on the basis of the parts. Similarly, in eight, we take Manet subverted traditional artistic norms, sentence two, attach Monet believed that to it, and then attach Picasso doubted that to that, and we get the slightly cumbersome Picasso doubted that, Monet believed that, Manet subverted traditional artistic norms. Again, I'd like to point out that this portion of the sentence, which is number two, we're taking to be true. But that doesn't tell us the truth value of this portion of the sentence, nor of the sentence as a whole, because we need, again, to do some historical or biographical research and f try to figure out what Picasso thought about what Monet thought about Manet. So again, with eight, we can't determine the truth value of the whole from simply from the truth values of the components. Nine and ten are also like this. Manet cleared the way for Monet because he subverted traditional artistic norms. 
that's likely, but in order to support this because statement, we would again have to do some sort of art historical research and uh, give evidence. It's not just based on the truth values of Manet cleared the way for Monet and Manet subverted traditional artistic norms. Similarly, in 10, uh, the after construction, which creates a compound statement, does not create one in which we can tell the truth value of the whole on the basis simply of the truth values of the parts. Because suppose we take Manet subverted traditional artistic norms after he cleared the way for Monet to be false. It seems like it should be the other way around. So if that's false, then you might think, well, true, two true sentences either side of an after are false. But of course that doesn't work at all, because if we just flip ten around and say Manet cleared the way for Monet after he had subverted traditional artistic norms, then that would be true. Again, context, historical knowledge are going to come into play here. We can't determine the truth values of seven through ten simply on the basis of their component parts. So what we're going to say, and we'll introduce this definition in just a second, is that four, five, and six are truth functional compounds, whereas seven, eight, and nine are non-truth functional compounds. Let's take a look at this definition. A truth functional compound is one in which the truth value of the compound statement is completely and uniquely determined by the truth values of the simple component statements. A non-truth functional compound is one where this is not the case, where we need information beyond just the truth values of the components in order to determine the truth value of the whole. We are going to start out the term studying truth functional logic. This is the logic of truth functional combinations of simple statements. We'll study the properties which arguments and statements have in virtue of their truth functional structure. And in order to represent this structure, we'll use capital letters A through Z to represent the simple statements, and then truth functional connective symbols that you see here to combine simple statements into more complex statements. So let's take a look at uh, how these connectives will work. The simplest truth functional connective is negation, which we represent with a hook. In order to negate a statement, say P, we just attach a hook onto the left-hand side of the P. So in this little table on the right, we have P and not P. This table is called the characteristic truth table for the negation, and what it shows us is the value of the compound based on the value of the component. This funny P with the extra stripe in it is what we call a meta-variable, and it's used to represent any old statement, whether a simple or complex statement. Whatever statement P is, it's either going to be true or it's going to be false. And the table tells us that when P is true, hook P is false. Not a big surprise there. And also when P itself is false, hook P will be true. So the negation of a statement has the truth value opposite the original statement, just as you would expect. The next simplest truth functional connective is conjunction for both and. And we use a little upside down V called the wedge to represent this. In order to form the conjunction of two components, P and Q, we put the wedge between them and we get P wedge Q or P and Q or both P and Q. Now, the left and right side of the conjunction are called conjuncts. And so that's a term you'll we'll be using a lot in the classroom, the left conjunct and the right conjunct. Now this table also illustrates the value for conjunction. Since we have two potentially distinct basic components, there are four possibilities for the distribution of truth values. Both components true, both components false, left side true, right side false, or left side false, right side true. And as you would expect, the compound, the whole conjunction, is true when and only when both components are true. In every other case, whether there's one or two falses, the conjunction is false. So nice and straightforward, just as you would expect. Next comes the disjunction, or either-or. 
Constructing a disjunction is just like constructing a conjunction, only we use the V instead of the wedge. So with two potentially distinct components, P and Q, to form their disjunction, we just put the V between them. Now we have a choice to make with the either or here. Obviously, an either or statement will be false when both components are false. And obviously, it will be true when one component is true, but not the other. The two middle cases there. But what about the case where both components are true? Well, we have a choice to make here. If we put a false there, we would be talking about an exclusive or. Right, where we exclude the possibility of both components being true. If we put a true there, we would be using the inclusive or. And in fact, for reasons we'll talk about in more detail in class, logicians do choose the inclusive or when talking about disjunction. We can always recover an exclusive or by combining disjunction with negation and conjunction. And we'll look at that in more detail in class. So again, just to reiterate, we will count our either ors as true in every case except when both components are false. That's because we're using an inclusive interpretation of or. Next we have the material conditional, the if-then which we represent with an arrow. To form a conditional statement from two components, we just put the arrow between them to form the compound. Nice and straightforward. We have two different parts to the conditional. The part that comes before the arrow, which we call the antecedent, and the part which comes after the arrow, which we call the consequent. Now, the truth value distribution here might seem a little bit strange, but we'll talk about it in more detail in class. But the basic idea is that we will only count this if-then as false when the antecedent, the if part, is true, and the consequent, the then part, is false. The final connective that we'll be using is the material biconditional. It's a double arrow, as you can see and we use it to represent if and only if. So again, we stick it between the two components to make the compound formula, and it is true when and only when the components have matching truth value. If they differ in truth value, as you can see in the center two rows, then the biconditional is false. And here we have all the characteristic truth tables together in one slide, so you can see how the connectives differ in their meanings. This ends Chapter 2, Video 1. In Chapter 2, Video 2, we'll actually be doing some very simple translations to get things started with the new language.